All right, everybody, welcome back. This is chapter 10 of Tolliver's Secret. i um, goal to be reading the whole thing and then coming up with a gist or a, uh, a short summary of the chapter at the end. Here we go. Hold back the night! Hold back the night! Ellen said over and over as they rode along. She watched the trees stand black against the dull red sunset. Slowly the sky faded into gray and then turned into night. She thought anxiously of Mr. Shannon's courier and wondered how long he would wait. Was he watching the few stars that came out in the wintry sky? It must be a long, long ride from Elizabeth to Pennsylvania. If the general was to have the message tomorrow, the first courier would have to start soon. Grandfather would have been there long ago had he come. It had grown very dark, dark when Mr. Murdoch turned his head to her and spoke over his shoulder. It's black as pitch. You better sleep in the loft with my boys tonight. Oh, no, cried Ellen. I couldn't do that. How are you going to get to Elizabeth? Ellen took a long breath. Walk, she said in a very low voice. Then she remembered the coins in her pocket. Mr. Murdoch, she said, I can pay, to, pay you to ride me to Elizabeth. Well, the farmer thought it over, but he said no more. I have the money, Ellen urged him. I'll give it all to you. Hmm. Well, would he ever make up his mind? You said it was only half a mile, she reminded him. We'll see what Ma says first. I have to feed my two cows in the woods and then be bellowing to be milked. Then I have to round up my pigs and tie them up. And then could we start? Asked Ellen. Well, Ma will be mighty mad if we don't sit down to her supper. Ma gets mad easy, but I reckon I can take you when I get through. Perhaps, Ellen thought, she'd better hurry on by herself. After all the trouble she had had today, it would be terrible if she missed a courier. But when she heard the lonesome howl of an animal far away, she changed her mind. Surely the courier would not start this early. It won't be so late, she kept assuring herself. She could smell the wood smoke from the chimney before she saw the shadowy house near the road. It, too, was tightly closed with no lights showing from the windows. Well, we're here, said Mr. Murdoch as he turned through the gate. He tied the horse to a ring in the wall. Open up! I'm home again, he shouted. The door was flung wide and two, boys, two young boys ran out. In the dim light, Ellen could see a big black pig tied by his hind leg to a stake just outside the door. Oh, Pa! The boys shouted as they gathered up the baskets. We found this mean old pig in the woods and tied him up. Good, said the farmer. We'll turn him into pork tomorrow. A tall, lanky woman came to the door and held it open for them. Her eyes were angry and her face beneath a ruffled white cap looked as if it were hacked out of gray stone. She bounced a crying baby on her hip and slapped at a toddler tugging at her drooping skirt. You're back at last, she snapped. And then to Ellen's surprise, she burst into tears. Thank the Lord for that, she said as she roughly brushed her tears away with the back of her hand. Ellen followed Mr. Murdoch and the boys into the house. The woman did not seem to see her. She was scolding her husband as she hurried to the fireplace and picked up a big spoon. In times like these, it ain't safe to ride to Amboy to sell leather. If you're dead, I got these four boys to raise. The bootmaker paid me and we need money. Mr. Murdoch lifted his yellow beard and took some money from the bag that hung from a cord about his neck. Nothing to be worried about. Worried, cried his wife in a high, shrill voice, with all those red coats around. She banged her spoon as she stirred the pot of stew that hung over the fire. Her voice became low and firm. Times were better before the war started, that's what I think. Now, Ma, don't talk like that. Mr. Murdoch pushed Ellen forward, but his wife paid her no mind. As she stood waiting for the farmer's wife to notice her, Ellen looked around the log farmhouse. The whole house was just one big shadowy room lighted by a fire on the hearth at one side. Pots and ladles and kettles of iron hung on hooks near the fireplace. In one corner stood a huge spinning wheel, and in another corner a big unmade bed with a trundle bed beneath it and a cradle beside it. When she saw that a ladder went up through a dark hole to the boy's bed in the loft, Ellen was glad she wasn't going to spend the night in that cold place. Mistress Murdoch was still upset as she put wooden bowls and earthen mugs on the table. I said times were better before war started. Everything was peaceful and we farmed our farm and no soldiers bothered us. She banged a pitcher of milk on the table. I said King George was all right. He didn't bother us none. 
Why do we want to change things? I marked this because throughout the whole report period, we've been trying to figure out whether people are patriots or loyalists or even on the British side. And this tells us very, very clearly that, at least right now, uh, Mistress Murdoch is a loyalist. She didn't think King George was, he thought he was all right. He didn't bother them. They just went about their lives. And now that they're trying to fight for freedom, she's seeing a whole lot of trouble. Mr. Murdoch pushed Ellen toward the fire. He seemed to want to change the subject. I brought home a boy named Tolliver who's mighty hungry. Ellen remembered to snatch off her cap and stuff it into her pocket before she nodded her head politely, as a boy would have done. The farmer's wife looked at her glumly. Then she looked into the pot of stew and gave it a quick stir. There's enough, she said, if he ain't too hungry. Pa, go out and hide your horse in the woods. Supper has waited long enough. With his wooden milk pail in his hand, Mr. Murdoch quickly pulled his cap over his bushy hair, hunched his shoulders, and stomped out the door. Boys, Mistress Murdoch ordered, go help your pa. She pulled the bench up to the fire. Sit, she said to Ellen. Ellen hadn't known how hungry she was until she smelled that pot of stew, meat and onions and turnips. What a wonderful supper for someone who hadn't eaten anything but oat cakes since early morning. She stuffed her mittens in one of her pockets and carefully untied the blue bundle. This bread can dry by here out by the fire while I eat su Oh, this is Ellen, I'm sorry. This bread can dry out here by the fire while I eat supper. It's my grandfather's loaf of bread, she explained to Mistress Murdoch. It fell in the water. The one looked at it. It's right soggy, she said. Not good for much. She picked up the wet kerchief and spread it out to dry on a pile of firewood. Your feet are soggy too, she said as she bent down to look at Ellen's shoes. And your breeches. Faith, you're wet to the skin, she cried, wiping her hands on her apron. Take off those breeches, Tolliver, she ordered. We'll hang them by the fire, too. Take off her breeches? And risk that woman finding out she was a girl? Ellen was alarmed. How could she explain why she was dressed as a boy? Only spies and criminals went around pretending to be someone else. Oh, no, she cried in dismay. I'm going to Elizabethtown tonight. Elizabeth? The woman stared at her. Tonight? In the dark? In this kind of weather, you'd freeze to death. But I must go. Mr. Murdoch said he'd ride me there. Ride you to Elizabeth on a night like this? The farmer's wife clapped her hands to her head. What now? That man must have lost his wits. She gripped Ellen's shoulders roughly in her strong hand. Take off those breeches, boy. You're chilled to the bone. What ails you? Are you bashful? Ellen drew back. Someone is waiting for me, she began. Suddenly, the woman picked her up, tossed her on the bed, and started to peel off the wet breeches. Ellen kicked her legs and tried to squirm away. At that, the woman's face went white with anger. There'll be no riding out there where those soldiers are tonight, she said through a tight lip. If he gets shot, I've got four boys to raise, so you can take off those breeches and let them dry. He's not going to Elizabeth, and neither are you. Now, oh, right here, it gets me wondering... Uh, a lot of strange things are happening right now. Mistress Murdoch is trying to tug off Tolliver's pants, or Ellen's pants, um, which is pretty rude. Um, but then she explains why she's doing it, and she actually blames Ellen for putting her husband at risk. If he gets shot, I've got four boys to raise. And so uh, she's doing something that's a bit rude to Ellen, but she's doing it to protect her husband and her family. So does that make it wrong or right? Just something to think about. In desperation, Ellen pushed a woman's hand away and, grabbing the top of her breeches and kicking her feet, she worked her way to the edge of the bed. Mistress Murdoch stepped back and looked at her. What's wrong with you, Tolliver? she cried. Quickly, Ellen scrambled from the bed and ran for the door. She was glad to find it not bolted. She flung it open and darted out into the night, pulling up her breeches as she ran. Thank goodness she had not yet taken off her jacket or shoes. She flew through the gate and across the road and hid among the trees. It was not until the door swung closed and all was dark around her that she remembered. The loaf of bread. She had left it on the hearth. A wild fright came over her as she stood shivering in the dark, cold night. What could she do now? She couldn't tell Mr. Murdoch. He was suspicious about the bread anyway. And she couldn't go back to that door. Sorry, back to the door. That stubborn woman might take away all her clothes and give her a cornmeal sack for a nightdress. She was shaking with cold and fear and anger. How could she have forgotten the bread that she had guarded so carefully all day. How could she have been so stupid? 
Then a square of light broke into the darkness, and there stood Mistress Murdoch in the open doorway. Here, pig! The woman said as she flung Alan's loaf to the pig. Turn that soggy old bread into pork! The door slammed shut, and all was dark again. Alan could hear the pig grunt and snuffle around. When he, when he found the bread, he would gulp it up quickly, and in his greediness, he would swallow the snuff box, too. Alan was afraid of pigs. She always walked clear of those lean, hungry public pigs who wandered about the New York streets and ate the garbage. She remembered the mean look of the pig who had chased her this morning. Now, this might be weird for us because uh, we think of pigs as those cute little farm animals that um, just kind of toddle around. Um, but back in these times, pigs sometimes roamed wild and they could be very, very vicious when they were looking for food. But now there wasn't a second to lose. She had to get the bread. She could feel her kneecaps shaking, and she couldn't make them stop as she raced across the road. If only there was more light from the, the pale stars overhead. She put out her hands to grope for the pig's prickly back, and when she felt it, she ran her fingers down to his lowered head. But the thought of his sharp teeth made her snatch them away. The smell of him, the awful smell of him, made her gag. Again, she reached out her hands. He rumbled in his throat and gave her a shove with his hips. She ran her hands along his back again and he snorted angrily. Now her eyes had grown used to the dark and she could tell that the bread was already in his mouth. She must grab for it. There was nothing else to do. Quickly, she snatched the cap from her pocket and switched it across his eyes, back and forth across his eyes. The pig tossed his head and snorted in rage. It was a terrifying sound. But when Ellen saw the bread fall from his mouth, she scooped it up quickly and darted out of his way. She was glad he was tied to the stake and couldn't charge her. And here's the picture of Ellen and the pig and reaching for the bread. As she raced through the gate and down the road, her feet barely touched the ground. She heard the door open and Mistress Murdoch call out, You all right, Pa? You got the boys there with you? But Ellen didn't turn back, turn to look. Mrs. Murdoch couldn't see her running down the road, for she was out of sight with the loaf of bread in her trembling arms. She knew Grandfather's snuff box was safe inside. She could feel with her fingers that there was one big bite gone, and not a very big bite at that. Since she had no kerchief to wrap around it, she tucked it up under her jacket, where it sat like a lump of ice on her stomach. Oof. And so, usually I would read the gist that we wrote, uh, but today I'm going to pause on that because that will actually be our objective for the lesson. So you should write down your own gist, your own summary of this chapter. And then when you watch the lesson video, we'll work together to make sure we do have a good summary of it together. Thanks for watching, or reading Andrew, and we'll see you soon.